Habits and Health, Episode 83. Welcome to the Habits and Health Podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. Brought to you by an educator and coach for anyone who wants to create a healthier life. Here's your host, Tony Winyard. Welcome to another edition of Habits and Health. My guest today is Dr. Brian Taylor, who is the Senior Director of Audiology at Signia, a division of WS Audiology. And he's also authored several peer-reviewed papers and textbooks and is a highly sought-out lecturer with 30 years of experience as a clinician, business manager and university instructor. And in today's episode, we explore hearing and hearing aids and many areas around how hearing health links to general mental and physical wellness. That's today's episode. Dr. Brian Taylor, if you know anyone who'd get some value from this, please do share it with them and hope you enjoy this week's show. Habits and health. My guest today, Brian Taylor. How are you, Brian? I am great. It's a privilege to be with you. And we were just discussing before we started recording that neither of us, the locations that both of us live, don't often experience glorious weather, but we're both having very nice weather today. That is right. We're experiencing the glories of summer here in Minnesota, where on the Fahrenheit scale, it's expected to be about 85 degrees with no humidity. Wow. And what is that as high as it gets in the summer for you? No, it can get into the high 90s and even over 100 on the Fahrenheit scale. Yeah, that usually happens a handful of days every summer. Right. If I was to ask you, Brian, who are you? How would you respond to that? Who am I? That's always a good question. I am a, I'll, I'll classify myself as a inquisitive audiologist, meaning that I am a hearing care professional and been one for a number of years who likes to ask a lot of questions, that's extremely curious and looks forward to implementing new ideas into clinical practice. It's interesting. On this podcast, we've had 200 episodes and we've never covered hearing and it's crazy. We've covered so many different aspects of health, but this is the first time we've actually ventured into the world of hearing, which is ridiculous, really. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm not really surprised that you say that. I think it's really interesting that for whatever reason, uh, people take their hearing for granted and in many places it flies under the radar. We don't really talk about mm. it much, but I do think that's changing. That's probably something we'll talk about today. And so how did you get into all this in the first place? Oh, I don't know. Back, I grew up in rural Wisconsin on a dairy farm and uh, where I think the cheese of Wisconsin probably is not maybe as good as what you find in the UK, but by US standards, it's pretty good. Anyway, I uh, moved from dairy farming into the healthcare professions through college. I found something that I wanted to do that was interesting where I could help people, where I felt I could make a difference, where you could apply science and psychology, things like that into one field. That's how I became an audiologist, more or less stumbled upon it through just taking different classes in college back in the late 1980s. And, and for those who haven't heard of an audiologist before, what is an audiologist? An audiologist is a uh, academically trained professional who is an expert on uh, hearing and all aspects of hear hearing disorders, auditory rehabilitation, which is mainly hearing aids and cochlear implants. It pretty much encompasses everything related to the sense of hearing, measuring it and uh, trying to improve it or rehab it. And I guess most people would assume that it's only old people need hearing implants and so on, but is that the case? I think that the majority of people that wear hearing aids and implants are older, but there's an entire subspecialty in audiology, pediatric audiology, that only works with or exclusively, primarily with, with children, infants who have hearing loss, born with hearing loss or acquired early on because of some medical condition. Um, that. Pediatric audiologists are closely related or work closely with speech pathologists because of the intimate relationship between hearing, speech, and language development. And if someone, their hearing's being severely affected as a child, how, uh -huh. using the various devices that are available, how much hearing can they get back by using such devices? It really depends on the situation and the diagnosis. If somebody has some type of a conductive hearing loss, which is a condition that affects the three bones of the middle ear space, then it's possible that they would get virtually all of their hearing back. 
But if it's a condition that affects the inner ear, the cochlea or the auditory nerve, they may only restore part of the hearing. But you know, it really depends on the condition. Did your company make devices? Yes. I work for a manufacturer by the name of WS Audiology. We have two primary brands, Signia and Widex, and we manufacture hearing aids. And typically, are those hearing aids going out to people of all ages and all sorts of different types of people? people of all ages, correct. How would they go about getting something like that? Uh, Right now, uh, you would have to see a licensed hearing care professional. There are a couple of different types of licensed hearing care professionals. There are audiologists, which are more academically trained, and there are hearing instrument specialists that they both, uh, in order for them to dispense hearing aids, they have to be licensed by their uh, respective state. Are you just operating in, in North America or are you global as well? No, it's a global company all over the world. And how long have you been going? WS Audiology was previously until about 2015 or 16 known as Siemens. And I'm guessing most of your listeners are familiar with the Siemens brand. So if you go back to the Siemens days, they've been manufacturing hearing aids for uh, close to 100 years. How does hearing health link to general mental and physical wellness? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. First, we know that there's over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a a rising amount of research out there that shows that there is a linkage between hearing loss. I'll use the term age-related hearing loss because I think that's probably more precise. There are some kinds of hearing loss that have specific medical causes. It's a small percentage. The vast percentage of people Older people that have hearing loss have what's called an acquired age-related hearing loss. And we know from research that is linked to a lot of different medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, uh, cognitive decline or dementia, uh, depression, social isolation, loneliness, uh, diabetes. Uh, There are a hand, maybe two or three theories that we think cause that linkage But a lot of it has to do with the the microbiology in the ear being similar to the heart or to the uh, metabolic system. But anyway, we know that there's a pretty close relationship between hearing loss and these other medical conditions. When people start to get signs of losing their hearing, what are there any advice steps to take? I think that the number one risk factor of age-related hearing loss is probably advancing age, meaning the older you get, the more likely it is that you're going to have some hearing loss just from wear and tear. So I think a good rule of thumb is if you're over the age of 50, it would be a good idea if you're if you get a baseline test. Now I say over the age of 50 if you're a relatively healthy individual. If you're somebody who's has a history of smoking or have a history of cardiovascular conditions or diabetes, you probably want to have your hearing checked periodically at a much younger age. Uh, But other signs of hearing loss include uh, ringing in the ears, uh, tinnitus. Another sign is when other, when uh, companions, friends, loved ones maybe uh, say to you that, hey, listen, I noticed that you're not hearing very well. When we're at home at dinner, you seem to be, um, you seem to be missing out on things. Uh, Maybe you should have your hearing checked. I I would heed that advice. What about people who in their work, they face a lot of noise, people like maybe in airplanes or musicians, DJs, and so on. Yeah, and I forgot that one. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, definitely. If you are exposed to noise in the workplace or recreational noise, like listening to music, go to concerts, listening through your earbuds more than a few hours a day, that would be an indication that you should have your hearing checked periodically. You mentioned about some of the devices that are available. How much has the technology for this changed over the last few decades? I think there's probably I, there's probably three interesting areas of innovation over the last few decades, especially over the last five to 10 years that have really ramped up. The first track of innovation that's really interesting is just the overall signal processing inside of a hearing aid and how smart it's becoming. Just to give you an example, the brain, the human brain has the remarkable capacity to recognize a familiar voice over other voices that are in the room and pay attention to a voice of interest and kind of filter out the other sounds in the background automatically. Mm -hmm. 
the signal processing in a hearing aid is starting to verge on how the human brain works as far as mm -hmm. it's smart enough to know these are the sounds that the person might be interested in. We're going to amplify those and these other sounds, even though spectrally they might be very similar, we're going to attenuate those as much as possible. So that's an exciting track of innovation inside of a hearing aid. The mm -hmm. other two have to do more with design and functionality. Another track that's really interesting, I think, is battery capacity. We've gone from the old battery pill that you throw away every week or two to rechargeability that's on the fly, on the go. You can have the battery pack in your pocket. You can have a recharging station at home. And I think that makes it really easy for people to use their hearing aids when they don't have to worry about changing the battery all the time. They just recharge it like they do their phone. And I think the third innovation track is around the style of hearing aids, the design. We call in our field, we call that the form factor. And you're starting to see hearing aids look much more consumer audio, Bluetooth headsets and earbuds. We're moving away from a stodgy, old fashioned looking medical device to something that's cool and fashionable that people want to wear. And I guess there's like a big range in a price range from the really good ones from these the starter ones, maybe? Yeah, sure. I think that's one of the things in the popular press that you don't often hear. And that is, at least in the United States, we fixate on the fact that for a lot of people, hearing aids are uh, the access and affordability. Those are issues. But the reality is there's a huge range in price from under, under for a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. It really depends on um, what you get inside the hearing aid, what it looks like, how much service you might be getting, those are all factors. But I think what listeners really need to know is there's a really broad price range. And so what kind of habits would you advise people to adopt if they want to keep their hearing healthy? I think the number one is just lead a healthy lifestyle. And that includes things like don't smoke, maintain a healthy diet, because we know from the research that both an unhealthy diet and smoking contribute to hearing loss. Uh, try to avoid noise. If you can't avoid noise, wear hearing protection. One of the lessons I've learned over the last decade or so is if you go to a concert, wear hearing protection. Even that a few hours of exposure can do some pretty serious damage to your hearing. And I, for one, like to use these, they earplugs that are designed to listen to music. So the sound quality is maintained and you get the protection that you need. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to wear the, the right kind of properly fitted hearing protection. That's probably the biggest thing that I would want to get across to your listeners. And what about for if someone, say, they swim a lot and sometimes you you get things to put in your ears for when you're swimming. Does swimming without using those sort of things affect your hearing at all? No, I think that's more of an issue. Some people have medical conditions or they can't get water in their ear or they're terribly annoyed by it. Maybe they have narrow ear canals and the water has a tendency to stay in there. There's different kinds of water plugs that you could wear, but for the most part, it would not affect your hearing in any negative way. And, and for people who do suffer from hearing loss, once they do get some kind of a device, how might their life change? What habits might they need to change? That's a good question. I think my first bit of advice there is it's always important to get a good test done. You want to make sure that you don't have some sort of underlying medical condition that could be treated with something that's not a hearing aid. There are some relatively rare conditions, but nevertheless, they do exist where you'd want to get treatment from a physician first. Once you get hearing aids, assuming that you need them and you're the right candidate, and that's something that a qualified licensed professional would work with you on. But once you have hearing aids, I can't emphasize enough that you got to give your brain, the auditory cortex, some time to get rewired. Another exciting area of research in audiology over the last few years has been looking at brain plasticity and how it changes when somebody has a hearing loss and not wearing hearing aids and how the brain changes relatively quickly and continues to change over a long period of time after they've been wearing hearing aids. And the research is starting to show that those plastic effects that you see inside the brain only happen when you're fitted properly with hearing aids. Meaning if you have a hearing aid that's not giving you enough volume, you've been mm -hmm. underfitted, you're not going to experience those plastic effects as much as somebody who is properly fitted getting the right amount of volume that allows the brain to rewire properly over a long period of time. 
about 20, 20 so years ago, my mum lost her eyesight. She went blind. And mm-hmm. before she went blind, her hearing was nothing special at all. After she'd been blind, I don't know, just li- only about five years or so, her hearing was absolutely remarkable. She lived in, a, in an elderly people's home and she'd often be sitting in this cafe and there was a couple of hundred people living in this place. And she mm-hmm. could recognize everyone walking past just from their footsteps. It was her hearing was absolutely, absolutely incredible. Yeah, there is something to that. That phenomenon is called cross-modal plasticity. And uh, there are a couple of research centers around the world that have studied this. But basically, I think what your mother experienced is what the researchers are starting to now finally uncover. And that is when one part of the brain that's responsible for, let's say, vision is not stimulated, another part of the brain, another sense will take over or commandeer that area Mm. of the brain and use it. So I think your example is consistent with what the research is finding. The other interesting step, if you take that one step further, is let's say for some, maybe some, through some miraculous process, her the vision was restored. There, the research would tell us that it's possible that those centers, the vision centers, are are sort of taken by the eyesight being restored. So that's where that cross-modal comes in. It's almost like uh, two warring countries fighting for territory and one kind of takes over for a while and then the other rises up and takes it back. And that sort of happens in the brain with respect to these different senses if they're restored through hearing aids or through surgery or whatnot. Well, it's amazing that you said that, Brian, because my mom's eyesight did come back Mm -hmm. and she was blind for about 18 years And then one day it just came back and the doctors could not explain. They did not understand why or how it came back. It just did. That's really interesting. Yeah. Hmm. But I don't recall, it's not a question I ever asked though, but I don't recall her saying that her hearing was affected much when her sight came back. Maybe she was so profoundly happy that she got her vision back that she wasn't so much concerned about that little bit of extra decline possibly in her hearing as a result of it. Anyway, it's a really interesting area of study, cross-plasticity. Nowadays, a lot of people, there's so many different chronic conditions that people suffer with. Are there any conditions that will often lead to deterioration in hearing as well? Sure, there's many. Uh, The the list is pretty long. Uh, You can start with more physical conditions like cardiovascular disease or cognitive decline, meaning that if you have those conditions, they could affect your hearing. And the, the, really the theory there is that we call the common cause theory, which means whatever is affecting the heart or the endocrine system or the executive functioning in the brain at the cellular level is also affecting hearing. So that's one, I think, interesting area. Another is conditions like social isolation, loneliness, depression, that it's a vicious cycle where if you're feeling depressed, maybe you start avoiding situations. And when you're avoiding situations, you lack stimulus. And then you can see how things start to to spiral. Your hearing is not as good, so you avoid situations. And then when you avoid situations, you don't get the stimulation that you need, you get more depressed. There's some theories around how those things are interconnected. So, um, you know, long story short, there's a lot of, there's a strong relationship between many of these medical conditions, psychosocial conditions, and uh, untreated hearing loss. If people don't use certain muscles, you get atrophy. So is that something similar in the ear? Is there a muscle in the ear? It's not really a muscle. It's more of a sense organ. It's nerve fibers. But yeah, there is definitely a use it or lose it phenomenon. If you're not, if the brain is not receiving a steady supply of sound, it's going to start to atrophy or decline. And back to the theory before, other modalities of sense, other areas of executive function may take over and start using the area of the brain that's responsible for hearing. When people come in to see you about the hearing, is Mm -hmm. there anything generally that is the most surprising to people when they're talking to you about hearing and health and so on? I think what's probably most surprising in my experience is how much hearing loss they may actually have. I think some people, I'm thinking about people that are in their like 60s and 70s who have maybe had a hearing loss for 20 years and they've developed a lot of coping strategies They and they do it unknowingly where you cup your hand behind your ear, 
you focus more on somebody's face and lip read, you get a little bit closer to them, you have these compensatory strategies that help you overcome the deficit of hearing in, in challenging situations. And when you actually then measure their hearing, they may, they're quite surprised by how advanced it might be because they lose it so slowly that they don't know what they've had and how much they've lost. Where would you say, where do you see progression and new technology and so on in the next sort of five to 10 years in in your world? Yeah, I'd go back to what I said before along those three tracks. I think you're going to see incremental improvements around better algorithms in hearing aids that help with hearing speech in the noise. This is an area that I think is a real strong suit for uh, Signia, for example. We have our technology is really effective at improving what's called the signal to noise ratio. And I think you're going to see more and more incremental advancements in improving the signal to noise ratio with algorithms inside of hearing aids. I think you're going to see advances in battery capacity and rechargeability, another area that I think Siemens and now Signia has been a leader in. And then finally, around form factors, these styles of hearing aids and make and having different styles, different form factors. I think, and then maybe more broadly, you're starting to see some things like that we talk about um, Fitbits, things that are worn on the wrist that count calories, that count steps, that count activity levels, things like that. I think you're going to start to see more and more of those kinds of, of applications on a hearing aid because at the ear, it's actually more accurate and it turns the hearing aid into a multitasking device, which I think has a lot of advantages for people. Yeah, I have a device from HeartMath for sensing my heart rate and I put it on my earlobe to mm-hmm. detect the heart rate. Yeah, the ear is a great place to collect that data. Out of interest, because you're obviously so much into sound and hearing. So I wonder <laughs> your views on people who claim that vinyl is much better to listen to, say, than digital sound. <laughs> have you got a view on that? Yeah, I do have a view on that. I've gotten out of that area since in the last 25 or 30 years. But I do think there's something to that. I do think albums, that analog quality has a warmer sound. I don't know if it's the, maybe it's just the act of taking an album out of the jacket and putting it on the turntable and hearing that sort of hissing noise, if that is a more of a humanistic quality that makes it more enjoyable. But I do think there's something to an album having a better, warmer sound quality than well, people don't listen to CDs anymore, but to streaming. And I think that what we forget is the the speaker, the loudspeaker makes a huge difference. People don't aren't into loudspeakers as much as they used to be. Mm. And I think music quality suffers because of it. But that's one person's opinion. And added to that, I don't think people realize how much difference it makes by hearing like music through really good speakers as opposed to really basic tinny speakers. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. You get the full bass, you get all of the highs. Just and what that's a br- really interesting question because for a long time, I'm a big proponent of sound quality inside of a hearing aid is driven by the same factors that drive sound quality in a loudspeaker that you might listen to music to, and that is low distortion, smooth broadband response. Those things drive quality, sound quality in a hearing aid. Is that going to be one of the main differences between? say, the more basic hearing aids and the more expensive ones, it's just going to be a much better sound quality than the more expensive ones. Yeah, I think that is a little bit of a factor. It's more, there's a lot of uh, more expensive hearing aids tend to have more features that can be adjusted by both the wearer and by the hearing care professional. More expensive hearing aids tend to have more what we call connectivity options where you Mm -hmm. can connect it to your phone, to your TV via Bluetooth. And I think more expensive hearing aids tend to have more sophisticated noise reduction technology in them. As we're we're coming to the end, Brian, I wondered if there is a book that you can think of that has really moved you for any reason. (laughs) That's a great question. I'm, a, I'm an avid reader. And I'm, if I wasn't an audiologist, I would probably be a, an historian. And I'll tell you one author that I've read all of her books. And she's an out. I just I do a lot of writing. And I just I marvel at how clear she writes on relatively arcane topics. She's a political scientist. She's American and she lives in Poland. Her name is Anne Applebaum. 
Mm-hmm. She also writes for the Atlantic magazine, and she's an expert on Russian history and mainly around the era of Lenin and Stalin. And she's written a series of books, one called Gulag, that's a very moving account of life in Soviet prison camps in the 1930s. So that's an author and Applebaum that I really admire and respect and love to read everything that she writes. For those of you that are interested in history, that's who I would recommend that you read. Okay, we'll include some of her book titles in the show notes and some links to some of her books. And if people want to find out more about Signia and your work, social media, where would they go? Well, Signia has a professional library. I think if, you, if, if someone was to Google Signia professional library, that would take you to, we have an embarrassment of riches on our professional library. We have white papers and published articles that go back about 35 years. So they're literally well over a hundred uh, white papers and peer reviewed uh, trade journal articles that are archived there uh, on um, a number of topics of interest. So that's where I'd have people go. Signia Professional Library. And finally, Brian, do you have a quotation that resonates with you for any reason? Yeah, I'll <laughs> I have a couple of teenage kids that I sometimes a lot of teenagers are difficult to motivate into action. So I'll give you a quote that I use with them from, I think, who everyone loves. That's Yoda. And the quote is, I think it's do or not do. There is no try. I think I got that. So Um, it's all about either do it or you don't. It's not about trying. And why is it that resonates with you? Because I think it's one of those things where you have to make a commitment. It's either instead of hedging on something you have, it's either you did or you didn't. It's no in between. And I think that's a good message for for teenage boys, at least. Brian, thank you for sharing your information with us and, and for, sh- well, helping our listeners to find out a lot more about their hearing and maybe some steps they can take to, to help their hearing health. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Next week is episode 84 with Douglas Lucas, who is a board certified orthopedic surgeon who left the traditional medical model to build a practice on health optimization and specializing in metabolic health, hormone optimization for both men and women and osteoporosis and longevity. So we talk a lot around many of those areas and chronic disease and what does it take to improve both health span and lifespan so that's next week episode 84 with douglas lucas if you know anyone who gets some real value from some of the information that dr brian taylor shared of us please do share the episode with them and hope you have a fabulous week thanks for tuning into the habits and health podcast where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. You can also sign up for email updates and learn about coaching and workshop opportunities at TonyWinyard.com. See you next time on the Habits and Health Podcast.